the Lord today, I have a few announcements I want to let you know about. Um, today, immediately, am I, am I on? Okay. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Sometimes I can't hear myself. Maybe that's a good thing. Um, so I learned later today after, today after service, if you are interested in going to the Ark and Creation Museum, we're going to meet in uh, the parlor area, just a brief meeting, just to talk about when we're going to do that, when's good for everybody and things like that. So if you're interested, I know there's a sign-up sheet back there about being interested. If you're interested in going to the Ark and Creation Museum coming up in the next couple of months, we'll meet here in the parlor afterwards to talk a little bit about that. Um, now, this, this week, coming on Thursday night, this Thursday night at 6 o'clock is the men's ministry meeting. Thursday night, 6 o'clock, men's ministry. Uh, they'll meet here in the parlor and uh, kitchen area. They'll have dinner. If you have any questions or if you want to bring something, you can see Todd. Todd's going to wave at everybody. See Todd, and he'll help you coordinate that, what you can bring. Um, and uh, he's still looking for some help, I know, on the meal. Is that fair to say, Todd? So if you want to help out with the meal, see Todd. That's this Thursday night. Um, Next Sunday, next Sunday after morning worship, we're having what we call the all committee meeting. We've done this at different times. We're going to try doing it after church next Sunday morning. Last Sunday during our business meeting, we approved the nominating committee report with all of the committees for the coming year. Now, if you're on one of those rotating committees, one of those committees that changes or a list that's a group of five people, we would invite you to stick around for lunch next week. If you can't make it, that's fine. We understand. But this is an opportunity for the committee to sit down together, see who else is on their committee, and um, have some meetings. And that way we can accomplish a bunch of stuff in as short amount of a time as possible. So we'll do that next Sunday after morning worship. Uh, lunch, if you're, if you're a member of a committee, lunch will be provided for you, and so we'll have that. You don't have to worry about bringing anything. We'll have everything for you, and that's next Sunday after morning worship. I think that's all the announcements that I have for right now. You will see, and there's new information coming out, about our Sunday night discipleship time. So Sunday night discipleship, we have lots of great stuff going on. It actually starts September the 11th. That is the Sunday after Labor Day. And so that Sunday night discipleship hour, what we do, uh, we come in at 5.30 and we have a family meal together. And so families can sit and have a meal. We all just share in a time of, of eating together and fellowshipping. Uh, beginning at 5.30. At 6.15, we start our Bible studies. Um, the kids from birth all the way through fifth grade are in Awana, and then we have junior high, a middle school Bible study, a high school Bible study, and then there are three options for adults. Now, the teachers from those classes will be talking over the next few weeks and kind of promoting those and letting you know a little bit more about those adult Bible studies that you can attend, but we have three offerings uh, this coming semester, and so we're looking forward to September 11th when we can kick off our Sunday night discipleship, and I hope that you're excited to be a part of that with us. It should be a, a great time, and I know that everybody that's been involved in the past has had a really good time. If you'd like to volunteer as in one of the positions where we need teachers, we need people to help in the kitchen, we need people to help in Awana, and so if you would like to help with one of those, you can see me and we'll get you signed up, and so we do appreciate that. I want to welcome you here today and say thanks for coming. Um, in your section of chairs, you're going to find a basket. That basket is an opportunity for you to give your tithes and offerings. If you're a regular attender here, and if you're new here, if you're not a regular attender in that basket, you'll find a card that says connect with us. If you would fill that card out and bring it to the kitchen afterwards, we have a gift as a way of saying thanks for being here. So uh, find those baskets in your sections of chairs, whether it's to give your offering or if it's to find a connect with us card, and, uh, and you can do what you need to with what's what you find there we thank you so much for being here today we're going to open today with a word of prayer we're going to pray today for our service but we're also going to pray for our students and teachers as they get ready to go back to a new semester of school so let's pray together dear lord i thank you for this day i thank you that we could come together and that we could worship you i pray that everything we say and do would be worshipful to you and honoring to you i pray that you would set aside whatever's distracting us today lord and that we would focus solely on you we do pray today for our students and for our teachers as they're getting ready to start a new semester and a new year of school. I pray specifically for some of those who are here in our midst who are leaving from here, who are going out and starting new schools. We have uh, middle school students starting high school and high school students starting college, and I pray that you would just bless them in a special way, be with their families, surround them with your love, and allow them to know that, that their child is safe in your arms. 
Lord, I pray that you would be with each and every one of us today and everything would be honoring to you. Lord, we love you and it's your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Stand if you would, please, and join us as we sing.
battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every dark 
of all names, the only name, the only way, and I pray that you would be with Jason this morning as he brings the word, that you would be with us as we listen, as we take to heart what you are saying through the man of God that you have chosen, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. This week I've been studying. On Wednesday nights, we're uh, working our way through and discussing different world religions, talking about lots of different things. And this next week, we're preparing to talk about Freemasonry. 
One of the biggest debates with Freemasonry is, is it actually a religion or is it just a social club? Not going to answer that question today. If you want to know that, you got to come Wednesday night. But one of the questions that accompanied this while I was studying was that a number of people who join the Freemasons are Christians. They're people who attend Christian churches and, and, and they, they identify themselves as a Christian. But one of the things that draws them into Freemasonry, one of them that, that makes them want to be a Mason, is that the Masons promise them that they will find a place of community, a place of support, a place of encouragement, and a place that will support their families. And I thought about that. As Christians... I wish there was a place that we could find community and support and encouragement and support for our families. Because apparently a lot of Christians are looking to the Masons for this. Not just to the Masons, maybe to the bars as well, maybe to a social club of another kind. But the bottom line is, there is a place where we as Christians are supposed to find these things. We're supposed to find these things in the church. But the church has a problem. And that problem is that we're not a lot of those things. You see, the church hasn't always been encouraging and supportive. It's not a place that people feel safe. How many of us have worried before on a Sunday morning when you're running late for church about what you're going to wear, how you're going to dress, if your kids are going to behave while they're in children's ministry, and any number of other things that we're concerned about? Not because we're actually concerned about those things. Let's be honest. Are we really concerned about those things? Are we really concerned about what we wear, about what happens when we drop our kids off to children's church, when we drop our kids off to the nursery, when we go to Sunday school, are we worried about those things or are we worried about what people will say about those things? Because I've seen y'all at Walmart. When people go to Walmart, they're not concerned with what they dress and how they wear, what they wear. They're not. And they're even less concerned with what other people have on. They're not concerned on if their kids are behaving or if their kids aren't behaving. They're concerned about getting in and getting out with a cart full of groceries and spending as little money as possible. That is the concern. But when we come to church, we're worried about these things, not because we really worry about these things, but because we're worried about what other church people are going to say about these things. And so it causes people to live in fear of their church family. And it causes people to not feel comforted and not feel welcome and not feel like they're a part of a body of believers of a family. And that's a problem. As Christians, Scripture calls on us to encourage one another. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other. The part that's for us is therefore encourage one another and build each other up. The next part depends on what you're doing. We should be encouraging and building each other up. But if we have to ask ourselves honestly, let me ask you honestly, do you think you spend more time building other believers up or tearing other believers down? Now, this would be a, a whole thing. So you, you get to include your time in Sunday school. You get to include your time here in worship. But you also have to include the time on the parking lot after a business meeting. You also have to include the time when you go to lunch after church. As a whole, do you think you spend more time encouraging and building each other up or discouraging and tearing people down. Now, I want to be clear about something. I'm not talking about being soft on sin. 
That's not what I'm talking about. We have to call sin, sin, and we can't be accepting of sinful behavior. That's not what we're talking about today at all. What we're talking about is criticism and backbiting that goes on within churches, that runs people off from churches, that turns people off to Jesus altogether. There's a difference between calling sin, sin, and talking bad about someone because you didn't like what they wore today. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we can understand why people turn to social clubs. We can understand why people seek support outside of the church walls. Now, as we continue to look at the book of Acts, we find ourselves today in Acts chapter 20. And Acts only has 28 chapters, so we're getting to the end. We're, we're approaching the end of Acts. But here we find Paul leaving behind his home of two years in Ephesus, where once again, after living for a long time, he is run out of town by a riot. Thinking about leaving his home of two years, Paul has to be hurting. He has, a, he has a mob of people who wanted him arrested, who wanted him tried. He would be perfectly entitled to mope around and say, woe is me, I have to leave my home, I have to leave my friends. I'm not happy. But instead he gathers the believers in Ephesus and he begins to encourage them. Paul may have parted ways with Barnabas some time ago. But the son of encouragement has definitely left an impact on Paul's ministry. You see in chapter 20, we begin with verse 1. After the uproar was over, Paul sent for the disciples, encouraged them, and after saying farewell, departed to go to Macedonia. And when he had passed through those areas and offered them many words of encouragement, he came to Greece and stayed there three months. The Jews plotted against him, when he, was, when he was about to set sail for Syria, and so he decided to go back through Macedonia. Now, as Paul is preparing to leave, he calls together those that he's leaving, and he wants to encourage them. As he travels, he goes through these places that he's been before, and he encourages those in those places as well. It's important that we remember that in all of this time of encouragement, Paul is fleeing for his life. He's busy, but he's not too busy to encourage the believers. In fact, as we read this, the Jews are plotting against him. They're going to attack him at sea, and so he has to change course and go by land through Macedonia. He's fleeing for his life, and he's in a constant state of danger. And what does he do? He encourages the other believers. He's headed. He's headed to Macedonia, to Greece. He's traveling. He departed to go to Macedonia, and he's on the road, on his way to Greece. And when he's there, and while he's on the road, he writes a letter. We know this from the timeline and other readings in Scripture. He writes a letter to those that are living in Greece. We have that letter today. It's in your Bible, and it's entitled 2 Corinthians. So while he's fleeing for his life, while he is fleeing from Ephesus, running away, he writes a letter, and some of the statements that come out of that letter are, my grace is sufficient for you, my strength is made perfect in weakness. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old is gone. We walk by faith and not by sight. All the promises of God are yes and amen. All of these are from the letter that he writes while he's moving towards Greece. Do these, re do these words read differently if we understand what Paul has just been through? He could complain. He could be unhappy. But instead, he continues to be an encouragement to the people of Corinth. He's just left his home of two years. And he goes and he sends this letter. And that's the gift of ministry of encouragement that comes from Paul. No matter what's going on, he continues to be an encouragement. He sends this letter on ahead of him because when the scripture tells us that he came to Greece and he stayed there for three months, where he's actually staying is in Corinth. During these three months in Greece, Paul does something else. So right here, 
between verses 2 and 3 of Acts chapter 20. If you want to put a little star in your Bible, if you mark in your Bible, if you want to put a little star between verses 2 and 3 of Acts chapter 20, Paul wrote another letter. We have that letter too. It's a letter that we call the book of Romans. Right here, he has fled from his home. He's now staying with friends in Corinth. He writes the book of of Romans. And not only right here between verses 2 and 3 does he write the Romans road as inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he also writes the words of Romans 8:28 which tells us, "We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose." Now, how many of us have ever been in a spot in our lives and someone shares that scripture with us? And many times we we smile and we accept it. But the reality is that that is the last scripture we would like to hear. Have you ever been in a spot like that where someone shares with you how everything's going to work together for good? There was a time my wife and I, we were dealing with infertility. We couldn't have kids. I know we have three. God fixed it. Spoiler alert. But we were struggling And people would say things about us having kids. And it got to the point I would just be honest. And I would just say, we can't have kids right now and we don't know why. Well, you know, God works all things together. I did not want to hear that. When you're struggling and when you're hurting, you don't want to hear that. But I hope today that as you understand where this scripture came from and what Paul he wrote it, that we can understand how true it was, and that when Paul was fleeing, when he's on the road, when he's in danger, he was still able to write these words. So when we're hurting, and when someone shares these words with us, Let's remember, maybe we can relate more to the author of these words than we can with the person that's sharing with us at that moment. You know, during this whole time, Paul is doing something else as he's moving from congregation to congregation. Paul is collecting an offering. He's collecting an offering from all of these different churches. And this offering is to go to encourage the Gentile believers at the church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem. The scripture tells us feared Paul so much that Barnabas had to stand up and defend him. The church at Jerusalem, who at very best has a strained relationship with Paul, is who Paul is going around and collecting for. To encourage them but through all of this through all that paul is enduring he is encouraging others he's encouraging others with scripture he's encouraging others with offering paul continues to be an example of encouragement to us but you know what paul was an encouragement to others and at the same time others were an encouragement to him Let's look at verse 4. He was accompanied by Sopater of Phura from Berea, Aristarchus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derbe, Timothy and Tychius and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us in Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread. In five days we reached them at Troas, where we spent seven days. Now you may read this and you just think, this is just an account of who was there and who went where, and moving chess pieces around a board. And at some point, Luke joins in the party as well, because the the narrative goes from they to we. But you see, Paul was encouraging people along the road, but along the way other people were encouraging him by coming alongside of him. 
Some of these men we're familiar with. Timothy and Luke, we know their names. Others, this may be the only time their name is mentioned in Scripture. But we shouldn't underestimate the encouragement that they gave to Paul just by their presence. The encouragement came from just being there. One of the hardest times I had during, during the two years that I spent as a missionary overseas, one of the hardest things that I faced was the night that my grandmother died. My grandmother told me she did not want me to come home. She did not want me to leave the mission field to come see her dead body. But the night that she passed was very hard. And I can still remember going to my truck that night and standing at the top of the hill and getting ready to get in and looking down and six of my good friends came walking up the hill. And I said, what are you guys doing? And they said, we're going with you. We're going to go with you. So they went to my house that night. We sat up all night. We watched movies and we played cards. They didn't do anything miraculous. They were just with me. And I remember what a comfort it was that I didn't have to go back to a house alone. So many times when someone is hurting, when someone's in pain, we say, I don't know what to say. And many times you don't need to say anything. You can be an encouragement simply with your presence. Just be there. Just sit with them. Sometimes the hardest thing for some of us is to just zip it and be there. But that can be some of the most encouraging times that we have with someone. is when they don't try and fix the problem. When they don't try and say something to fix it but they just sit with us and share in the ministry of encouragement. The next verses happened during those seven days in Troas, probably while they were waiting for their ship. Verse 7, we see, On the first day of the week, we assembled to break bread. Paul spoke to them, and since he was about to depart the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were assembled, and a young man named Eucatus was sitting on a window and sank into a deep sleep as Paul kept on talking. When he was overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was picked up dead. But Paul went down, bent over him, embraced him and said, don't be alarmed because he's alive. After going upstairs, breaking the bread and eating, Paul talked a long time until dawn, then he left. They brought the boy home alive and were greatly comforted. Now I know as you read this scripture that many of you feel like there's someone in scripture you can identify with like never before. I'm not going to look at anybody. But we read this about this young man that fell asleep, but there's so much surrounding this in this, this somewhat funny story. We read right here actually about one of the first church services that we read about in Scripture. This is one of the first places in history that we learn that the church met on Sundays instead of the Sabbath day of Saturday. It says they met together on the first day of the week. We also know that this church, when they met together, they assembled to break bread. This meant a couple of things to the early church. This meant that they shared a meal together, but this also meant they shared communion together. And it's interesting to me that we as churches today will defend the fact that we meet on Sunday because that's what the early church did, right? That's what we say. If someone asks us, why do you meet on Sunday and not on Saturday? We say, after the resurrection of Christ, churches began to meet on Sunday, and so that's what we do. We meet on Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And then if someone says to you, didn't the early churches also, when they got together, share meals together and take in communion? Mm-hmm. They did. Do you, do you do that? Because if you're imitating what the early church did, do you do those things? No. No, we just the one, but not the other, because we 
just don't. We don't really have a good reason, do we? We just don't do that. Many times if we read about communion, communion was around a dinner table. They had their church services around a dinner table. They shared in whole meals together. But some people don't like it that we have muffins out. I'll be honest. Right? People don't like that. Why? Show me in Scripture. I'll show you in Scripture where they ate together. We don't like it because we don't like it. Right? Why do we do communion quarterly? Because that's when we got to because the Constitution says. Right? Are we keeping it to a minimum? Is that what we're trying to do? Or are we looking to the early church and saying we want to be like them? I don't think we have to do it every week, but maybe we could do it more often. It's interesting that we follow so much of the tradition in some ways and not in others. But what we do see here is Paul capitalizing on his time with the believers. He talks all night long. Again, not something that we want to get involved with, right? All night church services might be an example in scripture, but no, we're going to stick to the Sunday and that is it. First day of the week, first day of the week, midnight is the cutoff. Then it's the second day of the week, got to be home by then. But I ask you, when, when something's important to us, when something is really important to us, does the time really matter? If you're faced with an emergency at work, and they say, we're going to need you to work on this until the problem is solved, and you have to work all night, you work all night, right? It's what you do. If there's something that you want to attend, if there's a concert or a ball game, it's, it's cardinal season right now, right? Let's say you go to a six o'clock cardinal game and it starts to rain. And they say they're going to push it and it's going to be a rain delay. How late do they have to push that rain delay? It probably depends on how good your seats are, right? If you've got really good seats, they can push that rain delay till nine. I can hold out. I can make it till midnight. But if we start church 15 minutes late, we all got something to talk about at lunch, right? I remember once they were filming in St. Louis, they were filming this show called The American Ninja Warrior. Are you guys familiar with that show, The American Ninja Warrior? So it was during spring break. So m myself and a, a couple of other families, we went to St. Louis. They didn't start filming until nine o'clock at night. And it was in March, and it started to snow. And you know what we did? We sat there in the snow and in the cold, and we suffered, and we loved it. <laughs> right? We tell stories about it. I was there. I looked for myself on television. It was amazing. But if I told you we were having church service, and it was going to start at 9 o'clock, and there might be snow... Is there an online option? Right? Because we don't want to do those things. But if something's important to us, those things don't matter. And what was important to Paul was that he encouraged the believers. Our attendance at church and when we come should be encouraging to us. And you know what? If people are, are, are talking and encouraging each other and we start a few minutes late, it's not a big deal. If people are loving on each other and encouraging each other and so we have to stay here a little longer on a Sunday, it's not a big deal. And we have to change our mind about those things. We should be encouraged by the meeting together. And we should be encouraged by spending time with other believers. And this means that as a church and as the church, we have to be done with our critical spirit. James 4.11 says, don't criticize one another, brothers and sisters. Anyone who defames or judges a fellow believer defames and judges the law. If you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy but who are you to judge your neighbor? Again, we aren't talking 
about spiritual discipline or calling sin, sin. We're not talking about any of that. What we're talking about is a judgmental and critical spirit that is not of God. We need to learn to be encouragers. We need to learn to encourage one another. We're going to do something. We are going to put into practice what we're talking about right now. Okay? So, if you will picture yourself in your comfort zone, look around you, that's your comfort zone. You are about to leave that area. Okay? What we're going to do in the next few minutes, I'm going to ask Debbie to come. Where is Debbie? Is she around? Okay, good. I was like, uh oh, I lost you for a second. Debbie's going to come. She's going to play a little bit of music so you don't have to go too far out of your comfort zone. She's going to play a little music. But I want to ask everybody if you would stand up. Now, I'm going to begin by saying, I'm going to remove myself from this so that this does not seem like this is the, the way the pastor had somebody come pat him on the back. That's not what we're doing today, okay? But what I want you to do is I want you to look around today, look around you, and find someone that you can encourage. That you can encourage with an encouraging word. Maybe God's given you a scripture. Maybe God's got something that you can say to them. Some, maybe it's just you just need to go and give someone a hug and just the ministry of encouragement in presence. But I encourage you to encourage one another. We're just going to take a few minutes. Go ahead. Thanks, everybody. Back in your comfort zone. Back in your comfort zone. (laughs) 
I hope, I hope that that was as encouraging. I hope it was that you were able to be an encouragement and that it was encouraging as well. You can have a seat. We'll, we'll wrap up in just a second. As a church, I hope that we can be encouraged by Paul and learn to be an encouragement to one another. We need to encourage each other like Paul when he was on the road. We need to encourage those that we encounter. We also need to, to learn to encourage by just being there. And we need to learn to encourage when times are hard. We need to be encouraged by our attendance at church. And we can encourage others while we're here. You know, we read about this story of this boy falling out of the window. And the scripture tells us that they were greatly comforted. And it seems like that would be his family was glad that he came home alive. But this word that says they were all in comforted is the same word that's translated earlier as encouraged. They all left being in church together, encouraged. Even when bad things happened, they left church being encouraged. So my prayer for you today is that you leave church today and that you're encouraged. That you're encouraged that you serve a Lord that loves you and desires community for you. Desires that you be in a place where people love you. And I hope that you leave here encouraged and feel that you know that you have a place like that. Certainly we can all do better, right? But I thank you for being an encouraging church. And I pray and, and I encourage you to do so even more. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, as we move into this time of invitation, I pray that you would convict our hearts when we're being critical. That you would spur us on to encourage one another. That you would put in our heart a desire to encourage one another. I pray that when we come to church, that we leave here encouraged, built up, and ready to face the world outside of here. Lord, I thank you so much for loving us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Stand if you would. We're going to have a time of invitation. If you want to pray with someone today, maybe you already have. Wonderful. I'll be over here. You can grab someone else. Have a time of prayer. And uh, we'll see you in just a moment.